Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's My respected ones, the feelings I have inside are really good. From Nanaimo and from Kinkolith, the Niskat Valley. Which means people of the inlet, referring directly to the Burrard Inlet. And it's indeed my pleasure to be here today on the announcement of the exciting announcements that are coming up, so I better not. Um, spoil the effect and I will turn it over to back to you. Hide Sepka, thank you. Thank you so much so much Carlene and uh, and thank you so much for the uh, warm welcome today. Um, I would also begin by introducing some of the speakers that we have with us today. We have, of course, uh, our Premier, Premier John Horgan, uh, that's here in Victoria. Uh, we have at the BCIT campus, a campus in Burnaby, we have Andrew Mercier, the Parliamentary Secretary for Skills Training, uh, Kathy Kinlock, the President of BCIT, and Shaq Davis, a carpentry uh, apprentice at BCIT. And so uh, I want to thank you all for joining with us today. It is an exciting day. And to provide more information about uh, what the, today's announcement is, I'd now like to invite up Premier John Horgan. Uh, thank you, Ravi. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And I want to, at the outset, uh, thank uh, Carlene very much for getting us started in a good way. I, too, am coming to you from the territory of the, Squam, or the, the uh, Songhees and Esquimalt First Nation. And I want to thank them for allowing us to work and live uh, on their territory. Uh, this past week, we've been able to lift some of the restrictions that the global pandemic have brought to our economy and to our communities. But all through the pandemic, our focus has always been on keeping people safe and keeping our economy working. The last two years of the pandemic and the extreme weather events of the past couple of years have changed our lives, changed our economy, and changed our future. The events have exposed vulnerabilities in our society, and we can't go back to the ways that were. But despite all that we've been through, the economic recovery in British Columbia is leading the country with the lowest unemployment rate and the highest job recovery rate. More people are working today than were when the pandemic began. And our economic vision has always been to put people right at the center of everything that we do. We cannot have economic growth that leaves people behind. And it's true that the pandemic has disproportionately affected the most vulnerable. And that is why we need to focus on continuing our strong economic growth with people at the center of what we do. 
Throughout the pandemic, British Columbia also led the country in supports for business, supports for people, and supports for communities. And despite our collective successes, challenges still exist. But can, if we continue to work together and focusing on our strengths and addressing collectively our challenges, I'm confident that British, British Columbians will come through this stronger than ever before. And that's why I asked Minister Callan to lead the discussion on the development of an economic plan for today and for tomorrow. The plan is to ensure that our economic success continues for the long term and will have, again, people at the centre of it so that all British Columbians can benefit from our natural abundance as well as our innovative economy and our dynamic population. This plan, of course, is the result of extensive consultations uh, Minister Callan and others have conducted with British Columbians in business, labour, First Nations, municipalities, universities and colleges, entrepreneurs, not-for-profits and many, many more. All of those people, all of those groups have had a say in part and parcel of what we're bringing forward today. And of course we are building on our advantages as we would expect and we're wanting to focus on the, the news that Minister Kang and Minister Callan uh, provided uh, just a few days ago that over the next decade we're going to need to fill one million job vacancies. That means we have to focus on uh, training the next generation of skilled workers and that also means we need to look to adding more people to our population to meet these challenges. What we've heard coming through the pandemic is that businesses need workers. Without a strong, skilled workforce, our economy will sputter and stumble. We want to avoid that. British Columbians want to avoid that. And this plan will take us down that road to the success that we all want to see. An important first step is today we are announcing a new trades and technology uh, complex at the BCIT campus in Burnaby. Uh, it will include four new buildings with 300 seats for students to enter the high demand trades of the future. It's very exciting and I know uh, uh, Kathy Kinlock, president of uh, BCIT, will have something to say about that, as well as Parliamentary Secretary Mercier, who is at the site uh, today, and will be able to talk about the heart of our plan, which is to train people for those vacancies that will be coming. Businesses have told us time and time again they need more talent. They've also told us that we need to have a housing strategy that will make housing more affordable for the new generation of workers that will be building the economy of the future. They've told us that we need childcare plans that are affordable. They've told us we need to build infrastructure, whether it be our roads, our bridges, our transit systems, our hospitals, our universities, our high schools. All of that is part and parcel of a plan that puts people first. We need to build the public infrastructure so that our private sector economy can continue to thrive and prosper. Whether it's um, small business diversification, whether it's our uh, vibrant life sciences sector, whether it's our natural resources, which we continue to have in abundance, but must be stewarded with a view to sustainability going forward. We need to focus all the while on inclusive growth and a clean economic recovery. Business is depending on all of us going forward. Depending on businesses that can attract and retain skilled workers, our plan at its core is all about that. I want to say that uh, BC's economic plan, as you've seen behind me and as Rabbi and I will be carrying around as our codex for how we build the economy of the future starting today, is very exciting. There's lots of work to do and I'll pass it back to Minister Callan. He'll have more comments to make. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Premier. It's been a, a tremendous honour to lead and, and, uh, and develop this, uh, this plan. It's been a labour of love for this province that we call home. And as the Premier said, uh, people have been through a lot over the last two years. And we've learned a lot about ourselves, about our province, and most of all, we've learned that at our best, we are a community. We look out after each other. We make sacrifices for one another. We trust one of another and we pull together. And that spirit should give us all hope. And it points to the way to an even stronger BC. As the Premier mentioned, we have listened to thousands of British Columbians from all walks of life. I want to thank all of them for their thoughtful and considered input to this plan. You told us what you care about. Jobs, competitiveness, climate action, skills training, good public services, childcare and housing. 
You told us that now more than ever, an economy built for people is an economy built to succeed. From the start through the pandemic, floods, fires, that's what we've worked to do. We have put people first. Today, once again, BC leads the country in economic growth. Wages are rising. And the last year saw the largest amount of people move to British Columbia in over 20 years. We have come a long way, but there's still so much more to do. That's why the Stronger BC Economic Plan is all about. The Stronger BC Economic Plan is about looking ahead 10, 15 years. It sets two big goals for BC to achieve over the long term, inclusive and clean growth. And it puts forward six missions that will help keep us on track. The Stronger BC Economic Plan is for you and your family. It builds on an economy that works for everyone. Let me take a moment to touch on some of the plan's highlights. The Stronger BC Economic Plan closes the skills gap with a comprehensive strategy to fill the jobs of tomorrow. Last week, we learned that there's over 1 million new job openings expected in BC over the next decade. 80% of those jobs will require some form of post-secondary education or skills training. Shortly, we'll be joined by Shaq, uh, a carpentry student at BCIT. And I know many people, young people, are watching today, and I want to speak to them directly. I know that the last two years have been tremendously challenging. You have made tremendous sacrifices, more than perhaps many generations before us. I want to say thank you. We all want to say thank you. As we come out of this pandemic, we have your back. Our government will help you fulfill your potential and realize your dreams. This plan is for you. The Stronger BC Economic Plan adds value and jobs to our natural resource sector. For generations, British Columbians, resource workers have built this province, generating the wealth that we all depend on. Almost three quarter of BC's exports come from our natural resource sector. They account for half of our economic base. For BC resource-based communities, I want to say we hear you. This plan is for you. The Stronger BC Economic Plan improves competitiveness. It leverages BC's low carbon advantage and it invests in high impact BC companies. It reduces barriers for workforce participation. I talk a lot about this, but I want to underline this today. Affordable childcare is our competitive advantage here in BC. To businesses who need new workers and to parents struggling to balance the need of work and home, this plan is for you. The Stronger BC Economic Plan supports BC's job creators. It grows our economy and it fosters innovation. To every small business owner working long hours and to every entrepreneur taking a risk on a new idea, this plan is for you. The Stronger BC Economic Plan builds on modern economic infrastructure, roads, bridges, transit across BC. To commuters, transit users, cab drivers and truckers, everyone who relies on this infrastructure, this plan is for you. The Stronger BC Economic Plan helps businesses and people trans transition to clean energy solutions. I'm so proud that BC has the best climate action plan in North America with Clean BC. We are showing the world that tackling climate emergency is creating new economic opportunities and jobs across our economy. To every innovator working on low carbon technologies, to every British Columbian doing their part to reduce emissions, this plan is for you. The Stronger BC Economic Plan seeks out new partnerships with First Nations to support economic initiatives. Indigenous peoples and leaders must be full partners of all aspects of our economy. It's an enormous economic advantage for BC. We know that our economic future requires full participation of Indigenous peoples. This plan is for you. The Stronger BC Economic Plan opens up new markets by promoting BC's unparalleled commitment to environmental and social responsibility. It closes the digital divide. It builds more affordable housing. It positions BC to be a global leader in new technologies like mass timber, and it grows BC's agri-tech and manufacturing sectors. 
This plan is for all British Columbians. Friends, I could go on, but I know you're excited to hear from everyone that's gathered. So let me conclude by saying this. As a Minister for Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation, I've been in awe of the grit and determination shown by BC's business and workers. As tough as the COVID pandemic has been, you have helped bring out the best in us. I want to say thank you. We all want to say thank you. It's not over yet, but the days are getting brighter. And with this plan, our government is keeping our focus on where it belongs, on you. With an economy built for your family, an economy that's built for all, an economy that's built to succeed, a stronger BC for everyone. So with that, I want to say, uh, I want to turn this over to uh, my colleague, the Parliamentary Secretary uh, of Skills Training, Andrew Mercier, over at BCIT. Training Andrew Mercier over at BCIT. Thank you, Minister Callan. And I'd like to acknowledge as well that I'm here uh, in Burnaby at BCIT on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. And I'd like to acknowledge the hard work that the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Training, Ann Kang, has done to make this project a reality. The best part of my job as the Parliamentary Secretary for Skills Training, hands down, is speaking with apprentices. I am so filled with hope when I speak with apprentices. They are, these are the people that have kept the lights on, kept uh, supply chains moving, kept our infrastructure running throughout the pandemic, and they're the folks that are going to be helping build our recovery. And I'm heartened by the conversation I just had this morning with uh, fourth-year BCIT carpentry student Shaq Davis, who we'll be hearing from shortly. BCIT is one of the largest trades and technology education providers in this province. And we do it better in this province than anywhere else. BCIT works closely with industry um, to make sure that we are training the people we need in, for the jobs for tomorrow. And we're investing here today in a new trades and technology complex at BCIT here in Burnaby. This will result in four new purpose-built spaces at the Burnaby campus, and it is going to support students from more than 20 different programs, from plumbing and steam fitters to engineers, carpenters, and more. And I think, importantly, it's going to help support uh, the Stronger BC Economic Plan by making sure that those workforce development priorities uh, you know, are, enshri are enshrined in this project. It will create spaces for marine fitters so that metal fabricators and boilermakers can take full advantage of the shipbuilding industry. And, and as well, you know, make sure that there's space for iron workers and carpenters to upgrade so that we can stay ahead of emerging technologies like mass timber. This is more than a building. What this represents is a generational investment in skills training and economic development in this province. It's going to create, just from the construction of the building itself, 600 jobs, but it's also going to ensure that we're training thousands of apprentices to fill the over 85,000 um, jobs in the skilled trades that we're going to need to fill uh, in the next 10 years. This is the future of British Columbia, and we need to invest in the best possible facilities for our students. So I want to thank BCIT for bringing this project forward. I know Kathy Kinlock has done a lot of work on this. And also I want to take a moment and just thank the local MLA for uh, Burnaby North, Janet Rutledge, for the advocacy that she's done for this project. So I'd like to invite Kathy uh, to come on up and say a few words about the project. Well, thank you, um, Andrew Mercier, Parliamentary Secretary, and thank everyone here for being on campus uh, today here in, in Vancouver, but also in, in Victoria. It's great to see you all, and uh, thank you as well for your leadership, uh, Premier Horgan. It's great to see you back. Um, Minister Kavlan, it's great to see you. We often see you on our campus ourselves, so it's, it's super. And Carlene, uh, thank you for being a member of our, of our family and being such a guiding light for us. Thank you. So my thanks to all of you for your support. We're speaking uh, to you today um, with excitement and hope, and we're really excited about uh, phase one of the new BCIT Trades and Technology Complex. It just seems to roll off my lips, so I'm so pleased about that. Um, today's funding announcement signals, as has been noted, phase one of the BCIT's new trade and technology complex. It will transform BCIT's Burnaby campus and our trades and technology training 
for learners in 20 programs. This transformation will also provide incredible faculty and staff more services than they've ever had before, and they've been working in less than acceptable services with 50-year-old building. It will transform our, our technology training as well for our learners, which is so important. And members can expect to see new buildings with collaborative spaces, state-of-the-art shops, covered learning arenas, and the continuing daylighting of uh, Gishon Creek, which will serve as a new pedestrian green space, as well as a living lab for students studying ecological restoration. This investment will help in um, BCIT's important role in the province ongoing pandemic recovery and facilitate our current and future success in ensuring highly skilled workers are key for BC industry and we will provide those and we will continue to work with employers. I'd like to acknowledge the generous donations as well that have come in from uh, the public sector, or from private sector, I should say, with the, the leadership of Dr. David Podmore, who will be contributing to the, these uh, donations will allow us to have uh, extra um, funding to, uh, no doubt there'll be extras as we go along in the course of the build. So our capital campaign has been very successful and wanted to acknowledge the work that's going on. I'd now like to, to invite Shaq uh, up to the podium to say a bit about his own trades journey and what this investment means, because at the end of the day, it's all about the success of our BCIT students, and I have no doubt Shaq will be the, a key successing um, person coming forward. Please come forward, and thank you again. Hello, everyone. My name is Shaquille Davis, and I am a level four carpentry apprentice here at BCIT. I am honored to be a part of this day and to share what all this generous funding means to me as a trade student. I came to BCIT with a degree in urban geography from UBC, while also having played football there for five years. It was there one summer that I got a part-time job as a carpenter, and it was then my love for carpentry developed. After graduating, I took the level one carpentry apprentice program here at BCIT and got a job as a carpenter apprentice. And pretty much, you can fast forward five years later, I'm about to take my Red Seal exam next week. BCIT is a place where students learn to maximize their potential while gaining hands-on work experience that is applicable to everyday life. Thanks to the support from BCIT, the provincial government, and industry partners, there will be more educational opportunities for, for students like myself in pursuing our career goals and becoming innovators for the trades industry. Thank you. I'd like to thank Shaq for uh, carpentry and wish him luck on his Red Seal exam next week. Uh, and thank Kathy as well, and I'll hand it back over to Minister Callon uh, in Victoria. Thank you so much, Andrew, uh, for your comments, and thank you to Kathy, and, and a big thank you to Shaq. We were all clapping uh, over here uh, with your remarks. Uh, with that, we will um, bring Premier Horgan up and uh, pass the mic over to Lindsay to take any questions. Thank you, everyone. As a reminder to media on the phone line, please press star one to enter the queue. You're limited to one question and one follow-up. First question today is from Vaughn Palmer, Vancouver Sun. Vaughn, are you there? Uh, I'm here. Go here ahead. There we go. Yeah, sorry. No worries. Um, yeah, a Stronger BC Premier was the theme of your 2020 election platform, and as I recall, many of the same talking points were in it. Uh, this is a vision statement. 18 months later, what's new about it? Well, what's new about it is uh, the announcement coming from BCIT today, Vaughn, of uh, creating a $136 million facility for 300 spaces, 20 different programs, and these initiatives will be duplicated uh, going forward. Minister Callan, uh Minister Popham will be making a, an announcement on Saturday with respect to expanding our agritech component. So all of the elements 
uh, that are in the Stronger BC plan are either underway or about to be launched. And uh, as you know full well, uh, watching uh, public events uh, over the period of time that, uh, that the ambitions and the aspirations become reality over time. We have our budget next week that will lay out, for example, uh, the creation of a new ministry that is particularly focused on ensuring that reconciliation, the declaration uh, on the rights of Indigenous peoples and certainty on the land base can be there for communities, Indigenous people, investors and workers. So all of the elements of the plan as you see it today, as we've talked about uh, over our time in government, are, are coming to reality. The building uh, that Andrew's standing, uh, what, that the building that we talked about today will be a community benefits a building. So not only will we be putting public resources into creating the spaces uh, for people to learn, as we build that space, people will be learning as well. And it's those types of targeted investments that will help us meet the uh, skill shortages that are so obvious to us now. Uh, you know uh, Vaughn uh, and others who will be coming to ask questions afterwards, every sector of our economy is crying out for more people. Uh, we have uh, the lowest unemployment rate in the country. More people are coming here than have come in decades. And that is not likely to stop with the opportunities and benefits of coming to British Columbia, where we're focusing on public house, or housing, uh, public health care, child care, and all of the other component parts that make our economy so robust and add to our competitiveness. So uh, what's new is that we're underway and we're launching uh, uh, not just a building today, not just Agritech, uh, on the weekend, but every part and parcel of what we've got in the plan here is going forward, whether it be connecting communities through uh, uh, broadband policies that are being accelerated, but all of those components will, will seamlessly come together into one stronger BC economic plan. Premier, I think Minister Kiel. Do you want to add that? Sure, go ahead, Rem. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Vaughn. And, and this plan is about making life better today and uh, preparing us for tomorrow. Uh, we've taken the learnings from the pandemic, from the floods, the fires, all the challenges we faced over the last two years, and uh, and and heard from British Columbians. And what we heard from them uh, is we need to close the skills gap. Uh, we need to uh, invest and in support uh, some new growing sectors, life sciences, agritech, clean tech. Uh, some of that is highlighted uh, in the plan. Thirteen new actions to make life better for British Columbians today uh, in, the, in the years ahead. Vaughn, do you have a follow-up? Yes, please. Uh, Premier, can you hear me this time? You're good. Hello? Yeah, Doc okay, sorry about that. Um, uh, yeah, could, could you explain the relationship between this uh, economic plan and the one your government put out two years ago? Uh, and the reason I'm asking is because that plan um, had such goals in it as improving the standard of living for all British Columbians and producing uh, greater government revenues without raising taxes. So are those two goals from two years ago still goals, or is this plan intended to supersede that plan? No, th no this, this builds on uh, the work that uh, Don Wright did, my deputy former president of BCIT built on uh, this plan builds on that those foundational elements of what is the historic position of the BC economy and now we're taking it into the future as uh, as Ravi has said uh, real wages have been going up uh, since uh, uh, Don Wright's plan and we want to see them continuing to go up so the quality of life is improving because we're reducing costs for people whether it be uh, eliminating medical services premiums, uh, bringing forward the child uh, opportunity benefit that puts uh, you know $650 a month into the pockets of, uh, of families uh, for children under the age of 18. All of these programs that we put in place and those that we've put in place through uh, the COVID pandemic allow us to have a little bit more comfort. Obviously, affordability is a number one issue for British Columbians. Uh, inflation is uh, at very high. These are largely uh, program, uh, policies that will have to be addressed by the federal government, but we're working uh, collaboratively on a range of issues and, and uh, the needs to ensure that we're competitive in our, in our businesses, the need uh, to ensure that we're building the, the infrastructure uh, that the economy will need, as well as those public services. And I, uh, we have always leaned, as you know, Vaughn, leaned in on the public service side because that's also about people. Uh, and nowhere is it more important than as we look over the past two years at the critical importance of healthcare workers, whether that be in long-term care, acute care, uh, home care. We've needed uh, those workers to show up every day and they've done so. We also now need to relieve the pressure on them by making sure we're training 
more care aides, more nurses, more GPs, uh, more uh, nurse practitioners, so that we can continue to grow these private, uh, public sector services. That helps our private sector remain competitive. Minister? Uh, Premier, I think the Minister wants to. You want to go again? Sure. Yeah. I'll just add that um, uh, this plan builds on the work that was done two years ago, but what we heard clearly from all the people we engaged with was a lot has changed over the last two years. Uh, the pandemic, as the Premier highlighted, has exposed, uh, and, and the floods and the fires have exposed a lot of vulnerabilities in our economy, and those things need to be addressed. And so this is an addition on top of the work that was done, uh, reflecting uh, all the lessons that we've learned over the last two years. Uh, and, uh, and this is what we heard from British Columbians, so that's why I was reflected in this document. Next question is from Rob Shaw. Check Before things. you start, Rob, oh, I just sorry. save on two questions, four answers. That's uh, pretty good economy there. Go new ahead, record, Rob. New record. Go ahead, Rob. Okay, maybe I get four answers too. I uh, just wanted to ask about the sort of progressive indicators uh, that this plan is, is kind of building on from that UK advisor. Like we know the economic indicators and GDP and we're going to hear finance officials next week in the budget tell us in great detail how they track them and why they're important. How do you use progressive indicators and how do you track them in real time to make them useful to you when you're, when you're making decisions? Uh, thanks, Rob, uh, and, and thank you for highlighting the fact that um, you know, most jurisdictions around the world are moving beyond just GDP and, and jobs as a metric. And so it's critically important for us as an economy to do that work as well. Uh, New Zealand, Scotland, most of the jurisdictions in Europe are looking at, of course, continue to look at jobs and GDP, but also looking at how do we track inequality to make sure that people have an opportunity to uh, continue to compete in the, in the changing economy. Uh, how do we track uh, new rental housing starts? Because we know housing is going to be critically important. So there's a whole metrics uh, that, uh, that have been developed by uh, the UN and others, and we're going to be working with those metrics on a live dashboard so people can see how we're progressing. I think it's vitally important for us to get a sense of how the economy is moving and how it's impacting people. Uh, and uh, we know, for example, if GDP goes up, sometimes it means that climate is being impacted and, and, and people are not seeing the benefit of that growth. And so we want to create metrics that show the uh, real growth opportunity, but can also track uh, the changes that affect people on their day-to-day -day lives. And, and that's what's reflected in the dashboard. All the uh, metrics we've chosen come from public information. So it's not some, uh, some data that's not available to the public. Uh, and we're going to continue to work with the business community uh, and other stakeholders on perhaps other metrics that they might think uh, that would be relevant for us to track in BC. Do you have a follow-up, Rob? Uh, sure, just an off-topic question for the Premier. Um, on Saturday, an island health worker in James Bay had their car blocked by multiple protesters yelling obscenities. And because of that, Island Health has done a review and will be taking logos off its vehicles in certain situations and asking Victoria Police for escorts. And I just wondered if you could uh, give us your thoughts, I guess, on the fact that it's gotten to the point where healthcare staff here on the island have to ride in unmarked cars with police escorts uh, to do their job. Well, th uh, thanks for that, Rob. And I, I was unaware of this. So uh, m my first reaction is profound disappointment that, uh, as I said uh, on Tuesday, we can disagree, but we shouldn't be disagreeable. And, and what we've seen uh, for the past couple of years, quite frankly, uh, prior to the pandemic and throughout, is a, a level of, um, of uh, frustration across the board. I understand that. But taking that to another level and, and uh, people yelling at school children, uh, for wearing masks when this is a decision that's been made in collaboration with, with families, with educators, with school boards, is just not acceptable. And going to those healthcare workers, going to their work site where they have gone day after day, sometimes double shifts, and I, as you know, have been through the public health care system uh, very intensely over the past uh, number of months. And the, 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 the look on people's faces from double shifts and the prospect of I have to stay because there's no one to take my place because they're ill or they've got potential symptoms. Uh, the last thing these heroes need, quite frankly, is thuggery and belligerence from those who will be there, regardless of that thuggery and belligerence, those healthcare workers will be there to hold their hand as they're intubated. So uh, it's just not acceptable. I think I speak for all British Columbians profound regret that there's that level of stupidity in some of our fellow citizens. 
Next question is from Richard Zussman, Global News. Uh, Premier, one of the parts of this plan, obviously, is built on a strong tourism sector. Uh, there are concerns from uh, tourism operators uh, in the province right now around the federal government's testing policy at the border. Uh, some of your other premiers, along with governors, have raised concerns about it. Do you believe that the federal government should waive uh, the testing requirements uh, to travel uh, back into Canada? And do you believe there should be another exemption in place for trips that are uh, shorter than 72 hours? And what impact are you are you concerned about any impact uh, this could have on the tourism economy with the discouraging uh, travelers from coming here? Well, well, first of all, I just want to say that uh, I'm grateful that uh, we've been getting advice from public health over the past number of days and into this week uh, that we can relieve uh, many of the restrictions that we had in place, uh, still keeping uh, those important uh, public policy measures like uh, masking in public places, using the immunization card to ensure that uh, uh, large ticketed and, and seated events have, uh, or restaurants and, and other uh, collections of people uh, beyond a handful uh, are as safe as they can possibly be. And I'm grateful uh, for that advice, and I know most British Columbians are as well. Uh, with respect to uh, border issues, this has been a challenge from the beginning of the pandemic. And you know, Richard, you've been, uh, uh, you and your outlet have been covering uh, the pandemic uh, every night uh, at noon and sometimes in between, uh, making sure that British Columbians understand the, the risks, the challenges, and where we need to go uh, on any given day. And we were among the first provinces to say that we needed tougher border restrictions. Uh, that was at the beginning of the pandemic. We knew less about the, the virus that we do now. We have more uh, uh, procedures in place to protect people, whether it be our immunization plan, which is, uh, has been the largest in our history, and uh, the uptake of British Columbians leads the country. So we have more tools available to us, as Dr. Henry repeats, to protect each other and to continue to have our economy grow and prosper. Our tourism sector has been hardest hit because people have not been moving around. And you will know from your social network that people are yearning to get back on the road, but they're also apprehensive. So there's going to be the marketplace will have to figure itself out. But those who are ready to travel uh, are frustrated by uh, extra layers of complication to their travel plans. They've already been uh, double vaccinated in some cases, double vaccinated and boosted. Uh, they're going to take uh, pr protocols and procedures to put in place to protect themselves as they go forward. And I think the federal government is seized of that. They've started to talk about relieving those restrictions. And I think that uh, the sooner they can get to that, uh, the better for all of us and certainly the best, best for the tourism industry. I'll add while we're still on this subject that I know uh, the uh, cruise industry, for example, was concerned a year ago about provocative measures by some in Congress, and we have worked, myself personally and uh, Minister Callon and others, uh, Minister Melanie Mark, have worked directly with uh, international providers as well as those uh, locally affected by any changes to the cruise ship industry. That is also going to require some federal uh, regulation changes, and I'm looking forward to working with the appropriate uh, federal ministers to make sure that can happen. Do you have a follow-up, Richard? I'm sure the new news is thrilled for the shout-out. Uh, I'm just trying to understand specifically, should there be testing requirements in place for trips shorter than 72 hours? You were outspoken about this uh, in the fall. The rules got changed, and then Omicron came. We have largely seen most Omicron restrictions eased. This one hasn't. So should that, like, are you advocating with your other premiers to get rid of this? And, and just specifically on today's plan, you know, where are those growth sectors that the province needs to focus on? How crucial uh, is agriculture here? How crucial, you know, in the tourism front is First Nations tourism? If, if Minister Callan or yourself could speak to that as well. But I just want to know specifically, are you advocating to get rid of that 72-hour or to bring back the 72-hour exemption like you advocated for it in the fall? Well, I know that the federal government is working on this, so I haven't been advocating. In our conversation uh, uh, this week, uh, it was focused on uh, events at the borders, uh, the federal initiative to bring forward uh, uh, the Emergencies Act. Uh, that was the focus of our conversation, and that has, I think, been the focus of the federal government throughout this week, and that's as it should be. Uh, I had early signals that they were moving away from their testing policy. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to hear that. I had uh, my son, just on a personal level, my son traveled back from the UK uh, over Christmas and um, was caught up in a series of testing um, uh, 
challenges, snafus, if I can say that on family television, I think I can. Uh, and, and so I, I know firsthand the, how frustrating it can be for travelers who have taken precautions. Uh, they're fully masked, uh, they're fully vaccinated, and in his case, he'd already had COVID back at the beginning of the pandemic. So uh, he was frustrated that uh, he had to continue to try and find uh, the appropriate test. And again, there was some uncertainty about what was the right test and where could it be accessed and how much would it cost? So it's not the cost question, that, although that's frustrating for travelers, it's uh, another level of uh, precaution that I don't know is necessary at this point, and I, I don't believe that's the view of the public health office either. Uh, the federal government had given early indications that they were going to get on this. Uh, I'll cut them some slack because of the other challenges they're facing this week. And I, I also want to, I don't want to miss the opportunity to say that when I engage with the federal government, my first, second, and third priority is focusing on the Canada health transfer and the importance of having an equal partner in the delivery of healthcare services in BC. That's my primary uh, objective with the federal government at this time, although there are numerous other issues we deal with on a daily basis at the ministerial level. Uh, and I know uh, Minister Dix is, uh, is engaging with uh, his office at numbers on these health questions. I'll add that um, uh, part of the plan is that people are our competitive advantage. So investments in people we know are going to give us lots of opportunities, uh, whether that's opportunities in agri-tech. Uh, we believe there's great opportunities in life sciences uh, with our clean tech and innovation. We have a tech sector that's growing very fast, um, but also getting more value from our uh, resource sector, getting more value and more jobs from all our resources. So this plan is about uh, supporting uh, the economy across the province. It has has elements for people in rural communities. It has uh, elements for people in downtown Vancouver, and that was the part we heard from British Columbians, and that's what I'm really proud of of this uh, of this plan. Next question is from Bender Sajjan, CTV. Hi there. I'm just uh, wondering, uh, Premier, I was speaking to somebody this morning in the construction industry who spoke about an acute labor shortage. Um, and while he acknowledged that the industry can do more to be inclusive and draw more people into it, he also spoke about, you know, limits on apprenticeships and um, also, uh, you know, the rules around being unionized for certain government contracts. And I'm just wondering, with the expected labor shortages, are those things that your government is looking to perhaps reconsider? Uh, no, we're, we're in fact accelerating our plans to train more people. Uh, and I, I say to the, uh, to the construction sector, Shaq is going to have his red seal shortly. Uh, and uh, he'll be looking forward to getting onto a job site and uh, practicing his trade, uh, duly certified uh, and ready to go. And we need more shacks. We need to multiply him uh, 10 times over to meet the shortages that uh, the, your, uh, your commentator focused on. I believe, and as uh, Minister Callan has said, we need to focus on people. We need to talk about skills and trades training uh, in high school so that there's a path forward. Uh, Shaq's story is not uh, unique. He, he went to post-secondary education to, to follow a passion and in the process found another passion. And I think that young people and myself, uh, when I was younger and, and many of the young people I know, start with a view of going in one direction and then find out they're going in another. Our job as government is to open as many doors as possible for opportunity to make sure that we're training the next generation. We have uh, a baby boom generation that's heading for retirement, and that's going to hu create huge vacancies on top of the vacancies that uh, Minister Callan and Minister Kang talked about in just general economic growth and the need uh, to have more people to do the work that's required. So our focus is on training more people so they can get into the industry and they can start uh, right away building their, their, their hopes and dreams in the community of their choice. Follow up, Binder? Yeah, I'm just wondering also, um, with regards to um, immigration, I just given like the large number of job openings over uh, the next 10 years, um, do you plan to have conversations or have there been conversations with the federal government about uh, better tailoring some of those programs to meet the needs? Absolutely, and that's a great question. Uh, we raise that uh, regularly, uh, British Columbia, as well as, as other provinces. Uh, Quebec has a different relationship uh, that's been built over, uh, over time when it comes to immigration. We've talked uh, to the federal government about uh, what British Columbia's needs are. Uh, we are a diverse, dynamic, multicultural community, and we require more people to meet the needs of today and the needs of the future. So immigration is a key part of that. I think I touched upon that in my 
my opening remarks, but it is, it is challenging to make sure that we get the balance right, uh, working with the federal government who have primary responsibility. We have a, what's called a PNP program. Uh, we'd like to see that expanded and, and more opportunity for, uh, uh, for it, provincial input into immigration policy going forward. But uh, with, with everyone that comes, we require more services. And so as much as we need uh, more people, we also, once they arrive, they're going to need housing. They're going to need childcare. They're going to need transit. They're going to need access to uh, K to 12. They're going to need access to, uh, to, to healthcare. So all, uh, for everyone who comes, we need more people to provide services as well. So it, it, it sounds like it's a cycle, but that's again, what built this great province. I'm the child of an immigrant, uh, as is Ravi. Uh, so we speak with some experience about the benefits of, of having a policy in place nationally that can meet the needs of our province. Uh, next question, Lisa Hughes, Deaf City News. Hi there. I'm just wondering, uh, Minister or Premier, for people who are listening to this, I'm just wondering what the takeaway is for them for how their life is going to be better. I'm looking at you know people who have kids or a dog or both who are trying to find a place to rent because you know, owning a place is just, you know, not even in the realm of possibility for them. And you know, you're saying that life has improved, but I think there's a lot of people who are still feeling so incredibly stuck where they are. And when you're looking at a million more jobs, I just don't, and bringing more people here, I think people are just not seeing how they fit in or how they're going to have a home to live in. Uh, very good question. And one of the key uh, issues that we've heard from industry, even I would, I would argue uh, back when uh, I was in opposition and uh, talking to business leaders, uh, first, uh, second, and third for them was the high cost of housing. We put in place initiatives to try and drive that cost down. Uh, we've been uh, successful in some areas, and uh, we're still working on success in, in others. Uh, I, I give an example. Uh, the number of vacant homes in Vancouver has declined while it's gone up in uh, Toronto. So 40% increase in uh, vacant homes in uh, Toronto, a 10% reduction in vacant homes in Vancouver. Uh, we put in place measures to reduce the uh, rate of increases in rents for, for, uh, for people and, and focused on how we can reduce their costs. Uh, housing is a big challenge. Minister Eby is uh, absolutely uh, diving into that with the gusto that he brings to all of the files I've asked him to take on. And we've seen uh, measurable improvements that does not uh, uh, necessarily translate for everyone uh, in the community. But the more we can build, the more supply there is. Uh, the less the cost will be. And if we put in place programs that discourage uh, speculation, uh, encourage people to utilize their housing, build more uh, on-campus housing, and uh, Kathy Kinlock can talk about the importance of that. If we're building student housing, that frees up housing stock in the broader community. Uh, and we built, just in one example, uh, we've built uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, student houses uh, since 2017, but just in Kamloops at Thompson Rivers University, we built more student housing than the former government did in 16 years across the province. So these initiatives all help us build the type of community we want that's inclusive, that's affordable, that meets the needs of everybody. Follow up, Lisa. I'm guessing we'll hear more about this at the budget on Tuesday, but I'm wondering if you can talk about for purchasing houses is there anything more that can be done? You know, you say driving the cost down, but certainly for houses, you know, they, they keep going up and up. I know our you know, assessment certainly did. So what more are you doing? What more can be done to have people here? We'll have more to say about that next week. Um, and I'm glad I had a budget question that I could defer. Lisa, thank you for that. Uh, but uh, Minister Robinson, former housing minister, uh, in her new role as uh, finance minister, has been seized of those challenges. And she and uh, Minister Eby have been working collaboratively on uh, strategies to implement the plans that we put in place and to make sure we're building not just uh, uh, houses for sale, but also rental accommodation that is uh, more family focused, two and three bedroom units rather than uh, bachelor apartments in the sky. We, we want to make sure that when we, when we are building housing, we're building it for, with a view to uh, families so they can grow in place uh, and make those investments, whether it be uh, purchase or rental, uh, make those decisions that meet their needs at this point in their lives. Next question is from Alexandra Sagan, The Logic. Are you there, Alexandra? Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Um, I'm just hoping to learn more about the ESG brand that you mentioned in the in the report. What is that going to look like? Is it something akin to like the B Corp certification, but a provincial stamp? Any color you can provide on that? We're really excited about uh, ESG Center of Excellence. Uh, we heard from uh, all people uh, that we met with that there's a huge opportunity for us to be able to not only uh, uh, attract more investments to British Columbia, but also to be able to brand and uh, export a lot of the goods and services that we produce here because of our strong environmental and sustainable governance principles. Uh, the ESG Center of Excellence will be require some consultation. Uh, I think one of the main things that we've heard is uh, don't create your own brand, work with other jurisdictions so that every jurisdiction is not creating their own standards. And that work is going to happen with Minister Heyman, uh, with myself and Minister Rolston. And so a lot of that consultation will happen over the next few months uh, and more details will come soon. Do you have a follow up, Alexandra? I do. Um, and there's a couple of new centers mentioned, the ESG Center, one for Agritech. Are these physical hubs that you're, you're planning or are they more virtual or a hybrid model? Uh, well, um, you're, you're trying to get me to scoop an announcement that will come, but I will say that uh, agritech and life science sectors um, uh, both uh, have opportunities for our economy to grow. Uh, we know through the pandemic uh, that all of a sudden people are aware of where their food comes from and they're concerned about how we ensure that we can continue to produce food with climate change in particular and so agritech gives us the opportunity to produce food with 80 percent less water uh, produce uh, more food without pesticides and have it locally grown so we're excited about the opportunities we'll have more to say in the coming days and of course the life science sector here in british columbia is the fastest growing in the country uh, bc actually had a very important Important role to play in the mRNA vaccine that is saving lives across the world. We're proud of that, but we know there's more opportunities, and we're working with the sector. And there'll be more to come on that as well in the coming uh, coming days and weeks ahead. Our last question today is from Mira Baines, CBC. Uh, there's a letter signed uh, by 25 municipal term communities uh, throughout BC, uh, basically urging the province to allocate funds. who would be affected by this deferral. And I'm wondering, is there any action on that fund? Uh, well, there's lots of action on uh, sustainable forestry in British Columbia. After the uh, 2020 election campaign, I appointed uh, Katrina Conroy, the first woman forest minister in BC history, uh, comes from the interior, comes from the resource sector, uh, to look and work on how we could implement the plan that we commissioned back in growth for the highest value to community now and into the future. Uh, and we've made great progress on that, despite uh, some of the more vocal uh, people in communities across British Columbia. We've made significant announcements about deferrals, working with Indigenous communities to meet our obligations, not just through the declaration, but uh, through repeated Supreme Court decisions about rights and title. Uh, and we have been trying to focus on part and parcel of uh, Minister Callan's work and the creation of a new ministry uh, coming through the next budget and into the next fiscal year is to make sure that we can do that permitting work, we can do that uh, transfer of licenses when it's appropriate to do, to, do so, uh, so that we can continue to have vibrant forestry activity, but in a way that's sustainable and protects those values that are most important to all British Columbians. And it's not a, an easy uh, dance, I'd say it that way, but we have uh, gone to great lengths to ensure that we're including as many people as possible in the decision-making process and ensuring that we can go forward so communities can be vibrant, workers are protected or in a position to, uh, uh, to continue in the sector in another way. Mass timber is a part of that. We've been talking about value added in our forest industry for decades. I can remember working in a pulp mill, talking about having people in the lunchroom talking about value added, and that was 40 years ago. So we've got a long way, we've come a long way, but we've got a lot of work to do. Our plan will assist in that regard, and it will include First Nations, it will include workers, and it will include communities. Follow up, Mira? Yes, uh, and this is for a question. Uh, this is for a
playing by all the rules. All the rules, um, if violators. That's a, a, a very sensitive point across the province. Uh, uh, hundreds of thousands, in fact, millions of British Columbians have made sacrifices, significant sacrifices, personal, financial, uh, over the past. Mr. Farnworth and his, uh, his crew, as well as uh, public health, have, have been working on this with the various health authorities so we can better manage those uh, that are flagrantly uh, disregarding the, the rules that everyone else followed. Uh, I, I can't get into any more details than that unless I look at specific cases, but I, I just want to say to those uh, uh, millions of British Columbians who have made sacrifices, my eternal gratitude and thanks, uh, not just for, on behalf of my government, but all British Columbians. We have been successful here by any measure compared to others across the country or the continent because we have hung together and we have regarded the rules equally uh, as best we can. And I go back to an earlier question about uh, uh, a citizen yelling and threatening uh, a healthcare worker or, or citizens yelling and threatening children. That is not how we should act. Uh, we need to hang together. And, and I know the vast majority, like 90% of British Columbians are thinking and living that way. And I'm very grateful to live in a province that has been responsive to the challenges by working together on top of the fires, on top of the floods, on top of the heat domes. All of us have been stretched beyond imagination. And when we see others not following the rules, disregarding the collective activities of the rest of us, it's extremely frustrating. And, and we're aware of that. And, and the minister is uh, keeping an eye on that to the best of his ability. Okay. Thanks for the question. Premier, I think the minister wants to speak. Want to get on that? Uh, Mira, I'll just uh, I'll share that um, overwhelmingly majority of businesses in British Columbia are following the rules, are doing what it was required to keep themselves, their workers, and their communities safe. Uh, we made it clear, even through our financial supports, that businesses that weren't following the rules, that weren't uh, trying to make their community a safe place, wouldn't get access to grants. And we've followed through on that commitment. Um, some businesses that were defying health orders did not receive financial supports. Uh, and uh, we continue to support highest per capita supports for people and businesses for those that are following the rules. So. Uh, I want to thank media for joining us today. We will now take a group photo, I believe.